Hello and welcome to this CodeBuddies.org live code hangout. By joining a hangout, you can ask questions, work through tutorials, share ideas, or pair program on open source projects. Today we're going to continue working on the WesternFriend.org website. We're migrating content from a site that is built with Drupal over the course of about six years and we're migrating to the Wagtail CMS, which is built on Django in Python language. And if you've worked with content management systems, it's very similar to WordPress in terms of usability. It sets a high bar. WordPress sets a pretty high bar in uh, terms of usability, and I think Wagtail takes a lot of uh, notes from the WordPress design, including you know, bringing you conveniences for the content manager mainly. Uh, cropping images, setting the focal point, um, so that auto-cropping can make sure that the important parts of the image are kept in place. You can um, run Wagtails and API and serve it up in, in different mobile apps, including smart watches, uh, any kind of anything that can make HTTP requests. And it's moving towards this paradigm of content being broken up into blocks um, based on the purpose uh, of the content, whether it's an image embed or video or a pull quote, rather than having one big body um, block of HTML, you have basically a list of objects and typically it's stored with uh, in JSON structure. So yes, looks really good. We're not up in the high level right now. Um, implementing features, we um, have gone through a lot of development over the last year, porting the features from the Word, uh, Django website over to Wagtail. Now we're figuring out the path to get the content, to migrate the content. So let's go ahead and hop over to the code. Let's check out, make sure my stream manager's up so I don't miss any messages. Got it. It seems that we've created some content exporters in the Drupal side of things. And they take, um, they provide us with a CSV of content. And we're working with a little cluster of content types relating to the magazine. Essentially, We've defined these importer commands, these management commands, to import um, magazine issues, authors, and departments. Um, departments are sort of like issues, but they span across time, whereas one issue is sort of one period of time. A, a department is like a, so an issue would be a vertical time division, and a department's a horizontal strata of articles <laughs> across time. That department issue. Issue, uh, sorry, articles can be in the department in each issue, the same department, in, in multiple issues. And uh, now we're going to look at the articles. And this is where, our, well, each step of the way we've learned new things. So we're going to have to look at efficient ways of um, doing in memory searching in Python. We're, we have this list of art, uh, excuse me, of authors, which is about 2,000 objects, essentially. Um, people, meetings, and organizations, and each um, in data structure terms, each item in the list has multiple attributes. And yes, I think it's about 2,700, so almost 3,000 item list with uh, six attributes. So it's kind of a big data structure all in memory at the time where the, we're turning over the, the import. And I need to find out a fi uh, fast way of finding a single item in that 3,000 item list that matches a criteria, a predicate. And I can do this with n native Python, and maybe it's going to be fast enough. Otherwise, we'll probably turn to pandas or some other approach. But this data is uh, on its way to a database, so I can't rely on database indexing or anything like that at this point. Although that might be an approach I could take as well. I 
actually. I had kind of um, anticipated doing that. Do a quick experiment. I'm trying to figure out. I want to scratch pads. I'll just create a, a Python file here. import articles and we have a relational data structure so we have foreign keys linking articles with authors issues and departments in the there's over uh, there's 3,000 article authors so that's the that's the tricky part and that's the first thing we'll look at today so <clears throat> let's just go ahead and uh, open up author CSV and I know it's located several iterations of this and it's difficult Oops, cleaning up data and whatnot and we had some miscommunication and uh, turns out these are not quite deduped the um, data in the content management system are still uh, there's a lot of duplicate authors that have different spellings of variations of their name so I was hoping that uh, we would avoid that problem and I wouldn't have to do these lookups and I could just do a really much more straightforward import but that wasn't the case, and I agreed this week to try offloading any more of the complex work to Python. If you know, if we take a little performance hit in Python, it's maybe not so big of a deal if somebody doesn't have to sit down at a um, screen and click through a bunch of uh, edit forms and stuff to fix the site content. So I recognize that um, usability counts, and I don't mind having a little bit of a, a wrangle, a data wrangle. So. I don't know if this relative path is going to work or if I'm going to have to use um, or I can just copy here. Let's just try this. Let's see if this works. Um, we'll go into our Python shell and if we need to install pandas, we'll just install it in this environment. I just this environment is sharing is shared um, by the deployment, the code, and these management commands we're running are going to be run in a deployed server. So if we have to turn to pandas, then it's going to make our uh, code uh, dependencies quite large. I think maybe not manageably. Okay, so a dict reader is not actually parsing it to memory, so that's good. That's the first thing. So essentially what we want to do 
Let's convert that to a list. And try to be Pythonic, try not to do too much. So this is going to give us an iterable, and hopefully this list method will just turn it into a list of dictionaries. <laughs> All right, so I've got to. Um, I can't expect too much magic here. I'm kind of accustomed to working with pandas, which um, abstracts this stuff a lot. I think I need to open a, <laughs> open the file with a, get a pointer to it, and then pass it to the dictionary. Or I'm getting a little ahead of myself, or just go straight to uh, pandas. You know, maybe we should just do that. I just don't know how many dependencies pandas is going to pull in here. CSV and, and the search, an efficient way of searching in line. So let's check out the dependencies. It looks like it's just NumPy, but NumPy's got some heavy dependencies, I, I bet. Let's go ahead and take a look. Let's see. Yeah. So a quick way of um, testing this out is just to install it with Poetry and watching our um, Poetry lock file and see how many things change in there. Ready? And pandas. Whoops. <laughs> while to resolve the dependencies. Just NumPy is the top level dependency. That's what's going to give us the quick um, index to raise. Hey, Rich, welcome. How are you doing today? How are you feeling? Have you been enjoying good, good weather, enjoying um, nature during your social distancing? I'm working on some uh, data uh, importing still and t challenges about looking up in memory um, data structures, so to speak. I have a list, I will have a list of 3,000 items in memory, 3,000 dictionary items, and I want to find the one matching item in that list by a specific key that each of those has a unique value for that key. I want to do it in a kind of performant way without, you know, doing a sequential scan for the whole list each time. I don't know if I'll be able to, maybe I'm just overthinking it, it might just not even be a problem. It might be fast enough just with plain old Python, but so I'm kind of checking out Pandas and NumPy approach. Now we check out our poetry lock though. I don't want to get too much of a um, dependency bloat in this project. I went for a walk today. I've been enjoying the, man, it's a beautiful sunny day here. Oh yeah. 
writing code? What kind of code are you writing for work? And I ask, is it or proprietary? I understand, but can you hint at some of the high-level details? And where's my diff? All right, so we got got the NumPy and pandas, yeah, yeah, and date utils, okay, and PyTest. Well, yeah, that's maybe not so bad. Hey, there's only a couple. Huh. And this is what um, pandas has been pretty good at being cross-platform. I'm just trying to think. You know, when collaborating with people, you don't want to. Sometimes dependencies will throw you for a loop. In particular, we use this time series modeling um, library called Profit, Facebook Profit. I've mentioned this on the stream a couple of times. And for s some reason, it's very um, haphazard to install this on Windows machines. I don't know. There's some dependency. Uh, I run Linux here, and I haven't noticed any problems. Um, I've been able to install, I think, with just pip and... Pippin, Pippin Van Poetry uh, in Linux. Not having, maybe I've got the build dependencies, I don't know, but our colleague tried installing it in their Windows machine to kind of replicate one of our Jupyter notebooks. And uh, ended up, they needed to use Conda, which is, you know, that's cool. We're trying to just unify our, our tooling chain, but not be too dogmatic. MDNS. I don't know what any of that is. MDNS and ZeroConf. I think I've heard of ZeroConf. Is that? <laughs> Let's take a look. This is a cool opportunity. Zero configuration networking. Ooh, this is really cool. So you don't have to have a DNS or a uh, DHCP server. You can just. This would be really cool for ad hoc networks, like just little um, mesh networks. I don't know if that's even the right term. I think mesh has a whole bunch of other implications, or I'm, I'm whatever the. Oh yeah, Pi Project Zero Conf. Let me check that out. Pi P. Here's our wagtail. Mm -hmm. Multicast DNS service discovery Python. So all the, yeah, see, yeah, I have used Bonjour and Alga, Vahi. Uh, Bonjour is like a Mac thing, I think. And, and that's just so your network devices can discover one another and broadcast a name, right? Something along those lines. Probably more complicated than that. But in a nutshell, because we were, what were we doing? Setting up like a little a couple of office devices, like a print server or a, a file, um, file server. I can't even remember what that was. Super insecure, though. The job. All right, nice. It was really cool. A little, we got this little file server. You plug it into the wall. It was like, a, uh, I think, just prior to the Raspberry Pi. I can't even remember the name of this device, but uh, it's like a low power PC file server, and it had an open source. suite of applications. Uh, I'll see if I can find it. It's essentially an open source low power file server wall plug. Tornado plug. Ah, first result. Dude. I don't know if they make it anymore. But the software is open source. The Because I'm being, I've been pretty big on open source stuff, and we were the school was like focused on sustainability, so we were like, oh man, it's got a really low carbon, you know, footprint, almost no energy use, and the staff can all share wall wards. That works, and that's just where, so tangentially where I kind of uh, first came into contact with the idea of zero configuration networking or bonjour. Because we had to, I was doing the IT administration at this rural school, and so I had to. Um, well, I guess I learned a lot of stuff, had to troubleshoot a lot of different situations, um, you know, do research and technology uh, acquisitions for printers and networks of devices. It's fun stuff. All right, see you a little bit, Rich. <laughs> All right. So 
So yeah, I think we can go with pandas here. It doesn't seem to be adding too much to our environment. And the thing is, since I'll be using pandas in the import code here, um, I can't really remove the package after we've deployed the project without kind of throwing out code. So I'm, it's another reason I'm just hesitant. Uh, but I don't think just having the thing installed is going to make much difference on the server. Uh, just having the package, if it's not invoked, it, it, you know, it's only going to be invoked when I run these management commands. So, okay. I think I've convinced myself. And Pandas, you know, it's just a nice name. Kind of cute. All right, now check this out. The difference here, um, keep in mind, bear in mind, I'm always learning, learning as I go, and I'm very naive uh, in a lot of ways. But, so I kind of expect things to work sometimes uh, optimistically, like I expected this to work. We're all, we all have our limits, right? But, so if I import Pandas, limits of understanding and we're all pushing our uh, our growing edges outwards so here I'll just say PD we'll create a what's called a data frame uh, I think you say re uh, there we are and this string can be a file path on disk and pandas is abstract enough has abstracted the process enough that we can get talks on that. Hmm. Oh, I think it's going to work. Why is it not giving me IntelliSense? Now this print is probably not going to do what we're expecting. <coughs> Okay, so it's printing um, column-wise. But you can see, it just I passed it in a, a string. I said, this is a CSV, and here's the path on disk. And it loaded it in. It created column headers. And um, What we're going to be dealing with is this Drupal full name is unique in the Drupal database. So this is what I'm going to have to be kind of using as the index to find a matching row each time. So I'll have, I'm going to specify this being the index, and I think Pandas will also use an intelligent way of um, sort of optimally finding the row that matches uh, a specified query. You know, rather than iterating over each row and checking, it'll more or less, I'm not sure what it does underneath it, but it can maybe bisect it and, and uh, do some more intelligent. So I just need to specify. Well, first, I would like my IntelliSense to work, so it'll tell me what my um, signature is, my call signature is, but I think it's just index. Oh, there we are, index column. Mm, now this is just. All right, so now you can see the Drupal full name is not here anymore because it's listed in the, um, it's actually the index, so let's see. Now I could just bust out a Jupyter <laughs> notebook here and start doing it in there. And I've worked in Jupyter notebook in the past. In fact, we might just continue that to sketch out the code for importing. And then I'll bring it into the import function. But I'm not going to install Jupyter in this environment, but let's go ahead and just uh, run that command again. So you can see now our index has, it's a uh, NumPy array. Um, of unique values, and they're already sorted, and you can see we've got 2,649 authors. So looking up and finding an item in that, you know, almost 3,000 uh, item list each time, uh, we import an article, and I think that, I'm just trying to think of how many articles there are. Not as many articles as authors, perhaps, but I think it was still like a 1,000 or more. 
I just think it's going to be slow enough that I can kind of worry about it a little bit. So the next thing we can do is just go into Jupyter Lab so I can kind of more rapidly uh, experiment with this code. here so let's just do let's set up an environment real quick just regular old Python virtual environment activate it and we'll install Jupyter Lab Pip's getting some, hey, welcome back, Rich. Pip's getting some nice features. Um, Pip, the Python package manager, is a little lower level uh, than uh, a couple of the uh, community contributed modules like Panda, uh, uh, not Panda, sorry, uh, Poetry and Pip Inv. But they're definitely taking note. Pip is sort of maintained by the core Python developers. I don't really know enough <laughs> about it, but. Um, it's getting things like uh, constraint solvers, uh, improvements that you've typically had to turn to poetry for. All right. We're in our Jupyter Lab. Localhost. For some reason, I got this bug on my computer that it doesn't really unpack this URL properly. When it loads it up, so I have to copy and paste that in there. It's kind of strange. It must be a caching issue or something with the browser. I don't know what it is though. All right, so now we're just in our folder here, where I created the Python environment, and we have a bunch of data. So I'm just going to create a new um, uh, notebook just so we can not do things so interactively. I can repeat what I'm doing, but I'm not going to be too disciplined here. Essentially. The cool thing about the notebooks is they let you rapidly experiment with code. Uh, it has some shortcomings because of that, um, but you can, with enough discipline and peer review, actually use these notebooks in a more production-oriented manner as well. So what we're going to do is run the same thing we did before. But now I should have some IntelliSense here, right? So I can, for example, check the methods of pandas. Jupyter Labs sort of becoming like a kind of its own IDE, and then a path. So this is going to be the author's and the index column. So now, now we're a little bit more rapid with what we're doing here. We can peek at some of the um, data. Another thing that pandas does is treats empty strings as NAND, which is kind of cool. As um, falsy, I think empty strings in Python might be falsy. What what food did you get, Rich? What you got for for dinner there? I haven't even thought about what I'm gonna have for dinner. <coughs> now the other thing we're gonna do is essentially bring in these articles. So articles CSV is the other one. And yeah, you can read from XLS files, CSV, JSON. It's really flexible. Um, for XLS, you have to install an additional Python library. Sausage and chips. <laughs> nice. I felt lazy today. Yeah, I've been eating pretty <laughs> bachelor diet 
as well recently. Yeah, except when my son's here, then we'll do. Well, he's <laughs> six now, so he got very limited taste. We still eat like uh, pizza and stuff like that. He, he we eat a lot of fish, so it's not as bad as it sounds, maybe. <laughs> and uh, here we eat a lot of salmon, and it's called lohi in, in Suomi. There's actually salmon and trout. Both are called lohi. Um, trout is called kiria lohi, and salmon is just called lohi. But we'll get some lohi and um, put it on a what's called a long pizza, a lohi longku pizza. So it's just cheese and um, smoked salmon. It's super, It's really good. It's super good. And he doesn't even like tomato sauce. So I'll have tomato sauce on mine and then cheese on the whole thing. And these either oven baked lohi. I'll get a like a lohi medallion, you know, lohi steak or whatever, a, a salmon steak, and put it in the oven for. 15 minutes, so it's just kind of pink and a little starting to turn white. It's white with hints of pink, I guess, flecks of pink, and then you can break it apart. And, oh, it's so good. <laughs> and then I cook it on the pizza a little bit longer. Yeah, salmon is so good. Is it, do you have a pretty easy access to it? Pretty fresh salmon there in the UK, I suppose. We probably get most of ours from, um, well, like Norway or something. I'm not sure. You can get fresh caught salmon. Um, I guess they fly it in in the morning if you want. All right, so we got our article. Let's just take out, um, take a look at what we're dealing with. So, only 914 articles. You can see it's not big data by any means, by any stretch of the imagination. But um, as you recall, the authors. about 3,000 authors and 1,000 articles. And for each of these articles, we're gonna have one or more authors. And here's a few of them. Uh, I did double check, but I thought. Um, This was going to be a list. Hence, it's plural because some articles have multiple authors. Okay. And same with keywords. We'll have to look at this. Sounds good. Yeah, and really healthy, too. We like, um, we do, actually, we do a lot of fish and chips, to be honest. And they have this UK style or this British style fish and chips or whatever um, uh, in the frozen fish section at a couple, frozen food section at a couple of the grocery stores around here. So it's like a little crispy, golden crispy, and you bake that in the oven for about 15 minutes. And we'll put some either potato wedges or seasoned chips in there. And oh, that's one of our favorites. We do that all the time. And of course we gotta have some cucumber or something with that. But again, it's like when he's not around, I'm eating like a bachelor, I'm eating ready-made meals or granola and getting all gassy. Oh, oh, I said it. And then, uh, when he's around, I'm eating, well, you know, a six-year-old uh, constrained diet. So we got lohi pizza, fish and chips, uh, you know, the lohi pasta, the salmon pasta, um, <laughs> tuna salad. He's vegetarian, and um, so he's our main protein is fish. And children are naturally skeptical, I think, about various foods of color and texture. I still, you know, I'm still not enjoying what mushrooms, I guess, are just still a little bit iffy. So I'm curious, I wonder if there's any authors. There should be one. I need to know what type it is, if it's a string. They're all objects, so.
to it. Print them all out. Yeah, here we go. So maybe it doesn't happen as often, but you can definitely see in this list. And we have Unicode. I just saw. Which should be fine. And uh, these are articles, so there's going to be duplicates, like, you know, uh, author has contributed multiple articles. Mary Klein is the editor, so every issue Mary Klein contributes the editorial article. All right, so and what we're going to have to do is just, um, when importing author uh, articles, we're going to iterate over the article authors and do something. Look them up in the other table. And if we find a match... That's good. If we don't find a match, then I'll print false or something like that. <laughs> yeah, a lot of different varieties. Um, yeah, pizza is really popular here in Finland too. I, I just haven't found what, like a pizza place that has like super good quality, like American style pizza. Even doesn't matter New York, Chicago, or kind of West Coast pizza. There, all the pizza here is like kind of limp and uh, just not very, not very good. Best fish and chips we had though was in um, oh where is that? In, uh, down near Atascadero. Morro Bay. Yeah, this fish market down there in Morro Bay. Not Giovanni's. Where is it? There's something by the seafront. It might be a Giovanni's, but it's up a little bit towards the towards the park. Let's see, where's Morro Rock? There's Morro Rock. Could be this, but yeah, because you can see more rock, and it's right by the water. Gee. Yeah, I guess this is a Giovanni's Fish Market and Gallery, and they got these little. Oceanside, or it could be this. Let's see, we were walking from Morro Rock. We came down, and there's this place that you get um, saltwater taffy. Here it is. So whatever this is, ah, this is it. Tognazini's Dockside 2. This is the best fish and chips we ever had. <laughs> and you just sit right here by the waterfront and enjoy the sunshine and eat fresh. I mean, they have a fish market in there and everything's sure pretty fresh caught so you ever I don't know if you'll ever have a chance to get down there in Morro Bay California uh, but I can recommend morrobaydockside.com Tognazini's Dockside 2 and then you can stop in and get this saltwater taffy here it's pretty yummy yeah what uh, yeah <laughs> let's see what kind of Pizza, do you like how do you like thick or thin crust or because uh, the even the thinnest crust in American pizza usually you can still pick it up and eat it by the hand you just gotta fold it a little bit and but the stuff here in Finland if you pick it up it just like goes boom and it just droops over it's ah so uh, I don't know disappointing I guess but it's okay we, we and we make our own homemade pizza so we do it how we like. I suppose what we'll do is let's check the length of them. See if it's treating as a string or a or I can just say type, I guess. Yeah, so it's a string of characters. So what we need to do is look up. Let's 
lip calmer. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. There we go. All right, so what we'll have to do is split out the author. Uh, so each row we're iterating over that, and then we're going to match the authors to the article. So now we want to say for author and authors. And this is where we just want to test this out. Um, so we want to look in articles where, so you can use this square bracket notation for articles. Uh, this is a little bit confusing. So the first time I saw it, and it still takes a bit to. Uh, uh, get used to, so I'm going to be explicit about this. Um, so if you've worked with a photo editor or maybe a stencil, you might be familiar with the idea of masking, which is like kind of a binary way of um, dividing up a space. And you can put down a mask and then only some of the stuff shows through and the other stuff is blocked out. And so the concept of masking in data is where you allow, it's basically filtering, you're allowing some data to come through and some to not. So yeah, the closest method in functional programming is filter. Um, yeah. Which we could also use filter here. Where are you going to head over in the U.S.? Do you have plans? Uh, a specific like uh, family or friends or um, if I can ask. We got, I have family in uh, Colorado and a lot of friends in California. And so we try to go there well, once a year, but it's a big trip. And this, uh, we had to cancel our summer plans, so that's, uh, we're not sure when we'll go back next. Can I not do the article author split? Has the same effect, but reduces the lines. Um, oh, I see what you're saying. Yeah, just put it down there. Yeah, it makes sense. I don't need to be so verbose. That's a good point. Got it. All right, so now we're going to do our lookup. All right, so we're gonna create this mask. And what you do is uh, you take a, so the mask is basically the same size as the data um, frame. Same kind of dimensions, same shape, and just allows some stuff to pass through. So you start with the data frame itself. And then you use the square bracket notation, and this is where you put your, essentially your predicate, where you wanna match, um, ah, sorry. Actually, where the uh, you can use this um, so I'm looking through the t um, column authors column where it equals uh, let's just say Mary Clinton. oh yes we need to be actually um, grabbing authors here, so it's, doing this stuff is a little bit mind-boggling, it's taxing. I can only do so much at a time because it's just a lot to think about. So for each article, we want to find the corresponding authors in a, t in a table, the authors table, which is an in-memory data store with a, an index that has a unique value, and 
page row. There we are. Okay, so then actually that's reminding me authors index equals Mary Klein. And we've pretty much double checked that. So let, let's go ahead and uh, I'll show you what this author's mask looks like. And I can uh, I can ensure that if I do value counts, in fact, if we go to authors, um, I think indexes have to be unique. Take a look at this author's mask. So, Las Vegas for a week. All right. Okay. Grand Canyon. Yeah, that's a great place. I haven't been there in a long time, but it was one of my dad's favorite places. We he grew up in Arizona. Yeah, sounds good. You could do the triangle. Uh, there's a lot. There's a lot of geographic uh, things of interest around the Las Vegas, Los Angeles, uh, San Francisco sort of triangle. But yeah, that's it. in a week, that's a lot of ground to cover anyway. So, hmm. All right. So what am I doing wrong here? Uh, for example, if I wanted to find it's just returning one value. So that's the strange thing. Uh, so that's weird. What happened here? There we go. Some, you can see these, <laughs> one of the hazards of working in these um, notebooks is the state changes in the cell. That's nonlinear. You can run cells out of order and then, uh, all this stuff is running in the background in a, in a sort of what's called a kernel, a Python kernel, and it keeps the latest state regardless of what order you're running these cells. So that's one of the biggest gotchas that can throw you for a loop, and sometimes you just need to actually kill the kernel or interrupt it and restart and clear all outputs types of stuff. Um, but generally, I don't think that's too problematic, especially for as rapidly as you can get stuff out the door and kind of prototyped. and. There's tooling being built around Jupyter Lab that's getting more IDE-like to help um, take these experimental notebooks and make them more production-oriented so, and you know peer-reviewable and stuff. It's pretty cool what's going on in the data science community in general. The, I think there's like a unification of languages. In fact, this Jupyter project, the name Jupyter, um, you might know this, but uh, I was surprised, uh, pleasantly surprised to learn that the JU means stands for Julia, the PY stands for Python, the TE is LaTeX and the R is R language. And what it represents is like this unification of the um, initiative. Not so the languages, there's still barriers, uh, but there are data structures that are portable across um, lang uh, these language environments that you can have in memory data that transacts between um, languages. If there's a library that's written in R that is really optimized for the type of analysis you're doing. You can do most of your work in Python, and then I think you can even run an R code in one cell. It's pretty cool. I haven't gotten it anywhere near that level of um, fun, but now, now our mask is working, as we were thinking. I didn't have to change anything. I just had run some columns out of order and broke something. There we go. So essentially what this has done, and one of the coolest things about, well, Pandas, but also like libraries like jQuery, is this idea of um, vectorized operations in, in, um, in the uh, pandas sense, or just applying an operation like one line on a whole uh, set of objects, uh, DOM elements, for example. And what this does is it casts uh, this, um, I'm not exactly sure what it does, but it iterates over the whole index and, and applies this um, this Boolean 
check, sort of casting it over the whole thing and gives us back this array of um, Boolean values. And now I can use that. It's cut out. There are some truthy values because um, Mary has uh, authored some articles. They're just not in the, you know, the first few we see here. Maybe we'll see. So, yeah, and uh, I need to just use. Well, there should be some truthy values. Let's see. So that's the first step. <laughs> Every step of the way, you just gotta figure something out here. Oh yes, okay, so this is authors. There's only one unique row in this uh, author set of Mary Klein uh, in the index. So that's expected we have one value. Okay, good to go. Skydiving, I just read that, oh my gosh, I did I overlook it the first time. I have thought about that, but I don't know, man. I, I have a feeling I wouldn't be able to get out the door. I'd get up there and have my goggles and everything and have, to be, have one of those instructors that just pushes you out. It'd be fun though, I mean, I, I just haven't ever done it. Um, my dad lives in Colorado in Boulder and one of my stepbrothers lives in I think it's Longmont and they have a, a field there, this, uh, you know, a little airport and you can drive, when we're driving by from between Boulder and Longmont, well, all, just all day I think they're out, uh, people are skydiving and dropping in that, that airfield. It's pretty, pretty cool. All right, so now we know we can do that lookup and that was fast. Actually, I didn't, um, I don't know how fast it was. Let's see if you can profile this stuff. I think, um, in Jupyter, there's these things called cell magic, where you can use um, what are these called? Not uh, oh gosh, the uh, percent sign once to um, do something in front of a row, or twice to do something in a um, a whole cell, and this time I think it's going to do that multiple times, and so to finding. Uh, to, to run this mask operation on the whole data frame. Um, it's very fast. I don't know, P, is that pico, pico seconds? So that's really fast. So essentially for each item in the, uh, so for each article, I'll split the authors and we'll find the matching author. So this is potentially, um, you know, a couple thousand. So we're gonna be doing multiple, uh, probably not. This is probably about oh, 1,100. We got 900 articles and only a handful of them have multiple authors. But you can kind of see what I'm, I'm getting at as um, probably premature optimization, but that's what we're doing. So now that I've got this mask and it's relatively quick, I can then apply it against the authors to get the item. There might be no, even another way um, I can, we can look because I just want to run one row that matches. So. If I take the authors and apply the mask to it, you can see it just returned that one row. Let's just take a look. If Pandas has a method to get the object, because what this returns is like a NumPy array or something like that. So it's always a little bit awkward to get the actual it's like a data frame to get the uh, so for example if I want a property of this given name it's actually giving me a series so it's not quite giving me the exact object. Um, and the reason for that is these masks can return multiple values, so it doesn't assume there's going to be one value. Let's just see if there's a quick way. Matching as dict. I want, I want really a as a row number.
So really, I think I can just say zero with one to dict. You can kind of see that's a little bit kludgy. And uh, it's just doing well because I'm grabbing the column instead of the object. And This is sometimes pandas are brilliant, but then I get frustrated mostly out of my own ignorance. Yeah, I mean it's got great documentation and um, very actively developed. So it looks like I can locate. So let's try this actually. So this is index, isn't it? Oh, man. I will figure it out. When did I start programming? Uh, that's a good question. Um, well, for work, I started programming around 2015. Yeah, <laughs> I was actually like sort of a lead developer <laughs> at that point. But I've been reading about programming for a while, on and off. You know, reading about Python since around 2005. Um, I've been interested in web development and studied a little bit of Ruby on Rails. Um, mainly I'd done kind of content management work. So 
Yeah, it wasn't until I actually just started doing stuff that I that sort of clicked and I was able to be productive. Reading about it wasn't quite sufficient, although I did read the um, Python for Dummies book cover to cover. I'm a trial and error programmer, I think most of us are. They don't have any formal background. Do you have a, how did you get interested in programming? Did you do any any um, programming when you were a kid? I did uh, learn about computers from a pretty young age, but not necessarily programming. So I like stacking. dick I think is the method I just got to get the row so I'll drop that from the query Yeah. Yeah, I think that's when I started really getting into computers also about that age. Yeah, so Spring Boot, that's um, isn't that a Java framework based on Spring or is that something different or am I just mixing stuff up? Something okay, and then GDPR knows. Well, I, I basically have it in hand here, so let me step back just a second. All right, I've got this data frame. How do I <laughs> select the zero zero? That's the one that throws me off. This is the one that throws me off. You use square bracket notation. Now we have it, and I think I can even just use two dict. <laughs> All right, whew, I was really close. You have to look it up. Now, I'm, I'm thinking this is probably a good design decision, but I've been bitten by that multiple times. I always think of iLoc as a function, like a method. I, I mean, it makes sense. It's you're, you're, you're doing indexing, and so square bracket notation is the way you do, like slicing. Um, Index-based slicing in this case. Okay, nice. So now we've got it. Boom, I've got the data in hand. So two lines of code. You can see once we get it worked out, it's fast and uh, sort of What's the word there? Not efficient, but where you don't say it, succinct? Yeah. All right. Yeah, and there's gonna be several layers through here. I don't know that I'll have this worked out in, in this session. 
but it's a trial and error. And I'm, I'm building towards a goal of being able to iterate over um, basically a CSV and create database um, rows with foreign key relationships um, between authors and articles you know, for each article in the database. So I have to be able to look it up in memory and then um, we're going to be needing to run a query. So now that this is all working, I think actually this is the point where I need to head back over into the Drupal the Django environment um, where I can start doing the database query, working with the ORM. Because I'm just going to use these attributes. I'm going to do another con uh, additional, you know, if, if it's a meeting type or an organization type, then we'll look in the meeting or organization column. If it's a, otherwise if it's a person, see if we've got a corrected given or uh, corrected family. While I'm here, I wonder if I can just sort of merge these. Uh, it's probably just All right, so we've got our author's CSV. Let's go ahead and split this. Over. Another cool thing, check this out. If um, it's got this contextual help and it's like an IDE, man, you can just split your panes however you want them. Uh, it's even got inline terminals. I just want to give some shout outs to Jupyter Lab before, quickly before we get, uh, before we move onward. You can put the terminal, I mean, you can just change the layout how you like it. And this runs in a web browser, so you can run this as, uh, in the cloud and you know on a server uh, they're getting collaborative features it's not quite fully baked in the uh, sort of the open source community where um, people can at least collaborate on notebooks not necessarily in real time but then i think there's some products out there that are allowing even real-time collaboration i'm not sure we usually just do pair programming where we'll sit and one of us will be like thinking of the uh, higher level details or reading the docs and the others doing the code but yeah i'm really impressed by what's going on again with the uh Data science community, the Jupyter project, NumFocus is a great organization if you're interested in data science. And I think they're not leaving Ju uh, sorry, Java out of the loop either. Um, I think there's a lot of great stuff you can do, especially geospatial stuff in the Java ecosystem. Uh, I just haven't seen as much kind of fusion between, um, well, yeah, if you're doing stuff like uh, Hadoop and whatnot for big data, there's, a, there's some pretty cool projects now that I think of it. I haven't worked much with those. In any case, NumFocus is really cool. It's got a lot of projects and it's not uh, focused around any one language ecosystem. It's, the ecosystem is the data science and the science community in general. This is a nonprofit organization. They provide legal, financial, and operational services for open source projects in the data science ecosystem. Excuse me. Ah, this is what I was looking for. There are a list of sponsored projects and then you might dig in here. You can see Java is not mentioned here, but uh, in any case, it's there. It's relevant. Um, but even JavaScript is in the mix, getting more capabilities. So yeah, if you're interested in just uh, going the direction of data science, uh, this this will take you in to some interesting directions. I've certainly learned a lot working with, just with a few of these, a handful of these, namely Jupyter and pandas and numpy, ipython, Jupyter is built on ipython, interact is another notebook interface, some of these are very specific towards like astrophysics and stuff like that, bokeh is pretty dang good, data visualization, this is for parallel processing, I've gotten to work with it, conda is another data science, a whole data science ePER system, uh, it's more commercial, like commercially oriented, but yeah, there we go. All right, so enough uh, of the tangents. Let's get the code back in the editor. Hey, Rich, I didn't ask you. Are you still around? By the way, uh, I'm not sure if you've hopped off the stream, but uh, would you be interested in doing some pair programming on this stream sometime? Kind of uh, inviting more um, active participants here uh, to do pair programming because I don't want the stream to be so like uh, it's not just about like what I'm doing, it's really, uh, I think it, you know, it is definitely my 
Twitch channel, of course, but uh, I'm trying to just promote more collaboration and Code Buddies uh, kind of ethos of working together with people and maybe doing either co-streaming where you know each person will have their own stream and we can um, stream simultaneously, or you can just dr join a pair programming session here in my IDE. There's this live share plugin. If you just want to hop in and edit some code and do voice chat there and be part of this stream without having to worry about setting up uh, you know, OBS on your own computer and things like that. All right, so we're just going to take the good parts from the previous one and actually it's already there, so I didn't need to import this. I need this article. Same file path. You can notice I'm hard coding paths, and I'll have to change my approach once this code is ready for deployment. And again, this is just a testing file, so actually, I don't want to be doing working here, do I? All right. Let me just get my code in a single workspace. There's not many lines, thanks to pandas. And the context is going to change. This is going to be article. I think we're good to go. So I'll go ahead and close out my kernel. You know, these save locally in the folder. So it's this PyPython notebook is actually saved in the file system. Everything running right out of the browser. This is just pretty crazy to me. Uh, pretty cool. And just close it down. All right, now we're just focused in one area. And even uh, VS Virtual Studio can, in, uh, increasingly work with uh, data science-y things. I haven't done it, so I can't really demo that. So now I've got this test done. I suppose I could have timed it, but uh, I'll start by working with just a few articles. Ten of them or so. All right, now we're going to go to our data importing app and create a new management command called import articles. And Django will register this uh, name, and I'm just going to put our code in there. And uh, the boilerplate structure, I've just got to double check. So go to Django, I see Python imports, Django imports, then third-party libraries. I don't know your import order uh, conventionally. So we're pretty much done here. I'll discard this file. I've got to double check. Um, I'm going to be passing in a file path from the command line now, come to think of it. Okay. Yeah, so I don't have to have hard-coded file paths in there. That's a good sign. It's a good start, but I'll need to pass in two arguments, two file paths. Hmm. All right, should be all right. So we'll import our models. So Essentially, 
exactly the same contact model to minus the index pages. This is going to be a complicated one. This is going to take multiple sessions. But let's just say magazine models are going to need article. kind of confusing. Where are my models? My article model. Where's that? Yeah, Rich always takes off without saying anything, and I don't know if they're still hanging out. Magazine issue, magazine index page, magazine article tag, magazine department index page, magazine department. Magazine article, why didn't it come up in the article bit? I'll uh, start with the uh, magazine article, mar magazine issue, and one with these contacts to cross reference for the authors. And we're going to link the tags in, but I'm just taking a little bit of time. Tags are optional right now, but we will want to preserve that metadata. Take a little bit of tea. Yeah, there's no real quick way of um, importing your data from you know, Drupal or WordPress over to Wagtail that I'm aware of. You kind of got it's manual work. You have to map the data structures, and so it's not too bad though. All right, so now inside of our management command, we have a we're going to create a class with some help text and a couple of. What do they call those magic functions or well virtual functions that you override? Mm -hmm. So it's just called command import articles and link them to. So you can see there's going to be several parts here. Each article is linked to one or more authors, one issue, one, uh, one department, and one or more keywords. So we're just going to have to handle each of those cases in turn. And I think the authors is a required field right now. Yeah, I might be able to, uh, let me just run this. I don't want to modify our data model too much in terms of like making migrations to make uh, fields optional and making them mandatory again. It's just a little bit of churn. I don't want to be too churny. create a dummy issue. And publication date is required for issue. I do have um, a working import script for issues. Why don't I just run that to be honest? Let me just spin out of this. Magazine issues. Oh, the server's not running. Oh, 
We have a bunch of issues here. Cool. The reason I did that is now I want to... Uh, I don't want to edit the issue. I want to add a child. Oh, I need to put a button there. <laughs> add child page. And we're just going to see what the required fields are. This is now a magazine article because of the way our content is organized and uh, the constraints we've put on the allowed types. You can only put articles underneath there, so it automatically... It automatically shows me the article form. It looks like everything is um, optional. Oh, really cool. So yeah, the first thing I can do is just a single pass to associate the articles with issues. The first 10 articles with issues. Let's try that. I wish I could do uh, a little bit of music on the stream, it would be kind of nice, but I think we would get the video get muted for a copyright violation, probably. So, unfortunately. All right, so let's take a look closer. A command consists of a help text, and at least uh, in my brief experience, some file system, like arguments that you can pass in from the, um, when you're calling it, like this dash dash file, which we will need two of those arguments and uh, a handler function, which actually does the work. And there's probably other, if we look at this base command, um, mod, bit class, base class, uh, it per looks pretty well documented. Uh, and it's got some of these methods you can override. This one, you can see it's just a sort of a virtual method. I don't know if it's literally a virtual method. Though. I don't think so. Hmm. What about the difference between execute and... Handle is the actual logic of command. Hmm. This is a, the required one. I guess the this is the only required part, perhaps. Help text is optional, and arguments are optional. We do want to add two arguments, so I'll just copy this line. And I think this action says to store it in memory. And so we're going to be able to We have, and actually, since we're doing just the author, uh, just the articles about authors, the first pass. I will comment this out. I'll leave commented code in there because I know I'll come back and need it. And similarly, I will comment this out. Because we're going to work just directly with the... Uh, Kind of guessing here. I can load this articles, CSV, and LibreOffice, but that would kind of saturate my memory. I think. So what I'll do instead is just print the columns.
think that's so when I'd say to store the articles file, uh, it should create a variable with the same name. Let me just double check. So we have this file here. And, oh, it's in a dictionary called options. Uh, okay. A little bit different than I was thinking. That should be fine though. So now, file path would be cool. Um, well, let's see. I don't know. So let's just try that. Let's print the columns, and I'm going to get the um, column for the issues. The goal in this session is to get to a stopping point where I can import articles and link them to the issue. Then I will come back and work through the articles code probably tomorrow. It's um, an hour and a half in, I find these sessions, uh, I can usually only do like two to three hours where before I get like just meh, kind of burned out a little bit. I've done a couple of power sessions before, but I think my productivity just drops and drops and then quits. Whoops, sorry. All right, so we'll see if this works. The articles file, save it. going to print the columns so we're, we're all right not doing too much heavy lifting here excuse me there we are uh, uh, ooh, we don't have the issue so I need to go back into Drupal and actually change our data exporter no problem uh, so I'm going to take a quick break and then we can go into Drupal, see how views are defined, um, re-export this data um, by pulling in the title from a related entity in Drupal. So going across a foreign key relationship, adding that as a column to the export data, saving it, and then bringing it back in here and probably be able to complete the imported um, at that point without too much fuss. I think all of the, uh, all of the issues have unique titles, so hopefully we won't. Struggle too much. All right, I'll be right back. Thanks for your patience and thanks for hanging out in the chat.
Cool, thanks for hanging out. Now, let's hop over to Drupal and edit the view. Without exposing too much sensitive security details about the websites, pretty common um, Drupal backend though. And it might be an interesting opportunity for people who haven't worked with Drupal to see, it's very point and click. You can do most everything through the Drupal UI. Um, one of the kind of reasons, uh, motivations for moving from Drupal to Wagtail, it's twofold really, but uh, we were realizing sometimes the user interface was becoming more uh, kind of a hassle, and particularly when I would encounter weird, hard to debug problems that um, may have been actual bugs in the underlying code sometimes, or just my ignorance, of course. I'll, uh, a lot of times that would be the case. I would just not know how to do something correctly. And ha but um, more and more, it's nice to um, be able to kind of trace through how things are working, and that, you know, you get that kind of capability when you're just writing code, and you can debug things step by step and stuff like that, where you can't really do that through a user interface as much. At least I don't know how to do with the Drupal UI. And uh, I don't really want to delve too far into PHP, so that was a motivating factor. And then also some of the our modules for Drupal, there's been a really long migration process to get um, things up to date, up to uh, compatibility with Drupal 8, and that's really been blocking us. We actually wanted to rejuvenate this website, so to speak. It's not like it's in bad condition, but we wanted to move a little bit faster on it, I think, and we're not in a rush, but uh, then we would have been allowed, then we would have been able to do with the uh, waiting on the module ecosystem to date their compatibility to Drupal 8. Drupal 9's already on the horizon, so in any case, we're pivoting. We're gonna look now at defining views. This has been this is one of the cool things about Drupal. Um, it lets you define content types, which are essentially um, structured content in a database. They they sort of map to tables, but I think internally it does something weird, like each each field is it in its own table, and then it kind of joins all the da data together at query time. I'm not sure how it works, but it uh, uh, gives you this user interface to define your own content types, which was already a big step up from WordPress, where most everything was um, either a blog or a page, and defining custom content types at the time we transitioned to Drupal uh, was a little more, more tedious. I think it was still part of only the... Uh, of the WordPress plugin ecosystem at that point. Now it's part of WordPress core and well documented and still you write code. So this was cool. One strange thing is every um, content type has to have a title field, an URL path field. So this is very similar to what Wagtail does. All the page content has to have this title field and URL path and a couple of other internal things. But these other ones uh, in like meta tag. So you can see I can't delete these fields. They're just part of the core content model for every content type in Drupal. That's been a little bit of a frustration. At least with Django, you can have some minimal content types that have none of these types of fields. You can just ar have arbitrary structure, and it stores all, all the content in a single table, generally speaking, unless you're doing foreign keys. So that's it. Most of our work has been to map these content types into Drupal, um, Django models. And now we're, the other side of that coin is you put the content in, by defining content types in uh, an editing interface and forms. And then you display the content uh, through a pl plugin module that became part of the Drupal core called Views. So, so it takes the name from like a database view, uh, sort of like a query builder, a graphical query builder. So let's go ahead over here and we've got a lot of these views created and we're gonna look at some of these data export. specifically the one where we are exporting the articles. So we'll edit this view. And for each article, we want to get the related issue. Uh, and issues and articles are separate entities. And you can see I'm getting some basic fields from the article, the title, the months. Uh, this is the issue, sorry. Let's look at the, from each article, we're getting title, authors, department, keywords. 
Any associated media? Oh, I do have the related issue. So what I think I've done, oh, excuse me, previously is set this up and export it to a different location on my file system. So we'll go ahead and uh, access this export. But yeah, this is very powerful. You define your export formats, your uh, fields that you want to display, and it can be a HTML table, a CSV file, a JSON or, uh, list, or uh, array, I guess. Um, arbitrary HTML templates is really flexible. Uh, it'll render it out for you. You can filter, you can add um, parameterized filters, you can add access control. It's very flexible, and everything you just point and click. Going to override this one, three point nine, and uh, hopefully that'll have all the data we need, all the columns we need. So we run this again. Yeah, here we are. Related issue title. So yeah, I had just that was an oversight at some point when I was exporting the data, and been working in a couple directories. A little bit sloppy, but. Now I'm trying to, I generally try to keep things a little bit organized, just so it's easy to find the work and I follow my own kind of convention so I don't surprise myself too much. Sweet, now we have related issue title. for the first maybe three articles to be conservative here. I'm just going to print the article related to your title. Print debugging a little bit. I, I probably should be running this in a debugger. It's a little tight. I got to kind of move it. See, I have my earphones stacked on top of the. Uh, yeah, microphone. So let's see if this first works. It should be iterating over the rows. So when I'm iterating over these, I'm actually iterating over the columns. 
instead of the rows. Um, there's a better approach to this, I'm sure. More. It's iter rows, isn't it? I think, can you subset iter rows? to see if I can at least iterate over them, and I will find a way to subset these because I don't want to do the whole batch. That's fast, but the database writes are going to be slow. So I want to get the code working with just a few handful of database writes and then run it on the whole batch. this though.
Mm, what if I actually... I swear I've done this before. If I slice it here... Hey, welcome, Manus Banzali. You just started learning Banzai, Manus Banzai. Cool, welcome. Uh, you started learning Python. Cool. What are you interested in building? Uh, what types of projects do you want to work on? All right, back to the drawing board just slightly. Since it's returning tuples, that's cool. Um, but I just want to see what it is, at least, and, and see if this um, slicing here is working. A little bit at a time. A little step at a time. Sometimes you just got to take it like a mountain climber. Uh, just make one little hill at a time. One summit, next summit, <laughs> depending on what your project is. Yeah, so it's looking like we have a an object, in fact. I don't know if it's a dictionary, but... So why can't I get that member? The related issue title member of the dictionary? Tuples, yeah, that, and that's literally what the error is telling me. So I just, um, boom, 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 boom. why does iter rows give me tuples? I didn't want tuples back, unless they're named tuples. I want named tuples. I started uh, reading about Python like. Back in 2005, it took me almost uh, exactly 10 years before I then started coding, before I really took it seriously. I did some like tutorials and practice coding, um, even using like Ruby on Rails and stuff for a while, but I never like kind of got any traction with it. And I, uh, well, hindsight's 2020. I should have stuck with Python for my personal um, preferences and projects. But in any case, I've come full circle through Ruby on Rails and JavaScript and back to Python land. I use as much Python as I can for web development, but I inevitably you'll, you'll need to use um, JavaScript, which is, so you'll have to learn that as well. Um, if you want any kind of client-side interactivity, uh, the browser is using JavaScript. The browser environment uses JavaScript. Am I using, no, I'm not, I'm not using iter tuples. <laughs> and the reason I'm, I'm sort of hesitant to use tuples is the only way to select items from a tuple is by an index location. So it's a little brittle. I like to try to be explicit. I want to treat this as a dictionary if possible. So I have the, you know, I can select it by key. I am working on a web uh, site, a website project for a nonprofit organization called Western Friend. And my path to programming took me through just website management, content management, and a lot of point and click stuff. Uh, we've been using this Drupal framework for a number of years. I think close to six years now for the website. It's really good. It's written in PHP. I just haven't ever coded PHP and I, I, it's not my kind of cup of tea um, but it's a really active community and if you're just wanting to set up a content management site like e-commerce or for any many different types of reasons including nonprofits and non-governmental organizations um, Drupal is quite versatile and the module ecosystem is uh, pretty good has um, I think fairly good ethos around integration and 
it's not kind of super hyper commercialized. But now that I'm more programming oriented, we're porting this site from Drupal over to the Wagtail CMS because I, we're just needing to kind of get more into the code and tweak things. And I'd rather be doing that in Python. So essentially Wagtail is uh, bringing a really nice developer and user experience to the Django web framework. And it's pretty easy to get up and running. And um, the core developers have been very helpful and friendly. It's a very active development cycle going on right now. So yeah, I've, I've, been, I've had a great experience with Wagtail. You know, Drupal is great too, so I um, recommend people check that out as well. But uh, you see there's a lot of contributors to Wagtail. I uh, had a surge of activity for a couple of years. It kept stable. Um, looks like this one very active developer kind of fell off. But it's got more than a handful of people who have you could kind of call core developers over the years. Maybe it's not looking this good lately. But Gasman's been very friendly, and you can see that Gasman's stuck with the project as the lead developer. They've got a fairly rapid release cycle. They just released 2.9 a couple of days ago, and right after 2.8 release. Uh, and, and these feature, these uh, releases have pretty big features coming in from a lot of contributors. So yeah, it's a it's a really cool project. <laughs> I'm getting more into the Wagtail core, learning more and more about it, but I haven't kind of crossed the threshold of actually uh, contributing or building a Wagtail plugin. We're just building our own website with Wagtail, but I do advocate uh, for people to check it out. If, yeah, if you're building any kind of website that deals with content management, uh, media fi you know, with media files, for example, or documents, uh, Wagtail will get you up and running quick. All right, so what I'm working on now, though, specifically is migrating content <laughs> from the Drupal site. We've prepared these content exports, and now I need to bring them into Wagtail in the Django uh, environment. So that's basically manual labor, so to speak. It's just um, there's not an automated tool to do it, and each content migration is specific to the, the site and the content structures of the website. So I'm using some cool tools to do the heavy lifting. But I'm just having a little bit of trouble. If I use this iter rows directly, then I can access members of the article just like they, like it's a, essentially a dictionary, but it's a, so what I'm actually act after is the, um, uh, doo -doo -doo -doo, I lost it here, so related issue title. You know, if we can just get this, I need to make a foreign key relationship. Our data, and most times when you're dealing with content management systems, you'll have relational data. So it's like stuff connected through relationships, like um, an article has multiple authors, one or more authors. That's a relationship between two different entities, article and author entities. So let's just print out all the, for each article, print out the issue name in which it was published. Okay, so now we're still having this trouble. So there's definitely something I'm doing wrong here. Articles renewed in this CSV, but this it arose. It returns an index and the data. The index is probably the tuple. Let's try this one more time. I'm going to try slicing it. Sometimes the errors are fairly opaque. A lot of errors in Python, though, are like pretty clear. They'll point you right to the line of code. They'll tell you what to do to fix it, even, even like in pandas and stuff. So let's just take the first three of them. Can I do that now? So I, I just had to catch that. This is returning a, okay, so here's the problem the whole time. It arose returns a tuple, it's, and there's two items in the tuple, and so I just need to catch both of those items. And if I just catch, if I just have an article here, then uh, the tuple is living here inside this variable, and then I would need to inside here I would need to say 
article, like the index of the tuple item, which is what I'm trying to avoid. So long short of it, this iter rows yields, it's a generator, an index and a data for each thing you're iterating over. So it's an iterator. Iterator, generator, I'm, they're similar concepts. <laughs> Let's see, Manas Bansai, what are you, uh, what brings you into Python? Are you interested in web development or data science? What, what's, uh, what kind of things are you wanting to work on? So we should just have now three. Yeah, here we go. All right, so the reason I'm just wanting to subset this is to not get too uh, carried away and just do a little bit of data at a time. <laughs> so the next thing is I'm going to get that related issue. This has a variable to keep my code fairly um, Let me just think here one second. Actually, I'll just fetch it in line. So that's getting, that's kind of pushing the limit of what. I want to do, but I'm essentially wanting to get one issue out of the database, objects, looking it up, and hopefully, yeah, the title field should have indexing, so it'll be quick to, to run that query. Um, and we should only find one. So I don't remember, get or find is the right word. Ah, it is git. Find will return a query set. Git will re return the single object. So let's just say print related issue. Now this should print three issues again, but now they'll actually be the related entity, a database entity. So it'll have a little bit more. Uh, it should actually say on art because it'll the print will run this the dunder string str method, which is fine. Which is fine. All right, so I need to put a catch around that and um, check why that. doesn't exist on art. Oh, is there trailing white space? So if we go to magazine, I don't think I have to have the server running to do these commands. So that is the error. There's actually the issue's not in here. How did that happen? Let me just make sure the uh, issues importer isn't uh, subsetting the data. Just using all the issues, should be importing everything. So let me check our 
our export file. Let me just also check on art on the website. So I think what happened <laughs> with this case, in fact, is the export data, again, is older. I just <laughs> exported these issues like a, like, a, wait a minute, I think like a week ago or something, and this issue was just published. And I exported the articles just now. So, all right, I gotta be careful to make sure I run these exports at the same time with fresh data. Now we're good to go. Ah, oh, that's not actually what I wanted to do on this. Create a new terminal. Well. Delete all the issues. We're going to re-import them. Importer again for the issues. Did I, did I save it in the right place? Let's just do it with him. I'm almost positive I did. Let me check the date on it. Just now. Cool. So it's going to I need to put the argument to a file. Going to import them and give me a bunch of warnings about na naive date times without time zone. But now we're good to go. If I hop back over here to, to the magazine issues and I just F5. Now I look for on art. And we have one that was published March 2020, so it's the latest issue. Essentially, I can now associate these articles with it. Because hmm. I'll be able to query it. environment did it use?
VS Code might have picked up a stale environment. I don't know what happened there. Yeah, so we get a printout, which is the stringified issue. So yes, this is good to go now. Um, so when you print in like a, an instance in Python, if it has a dunder str method, it'll just print the output of that. So what we need to do now is figure out how to make this association. So create the, um, so get the issue and add a child, I think is all we have to do. For authors, it's gonna be a little bit different, but we'll handle that another day. So when I'm um, importing authors, we have an example where you find an instance and you add a child of the, uh, that. So Wagtail content is hierarchical by default. You can define just flat um, Django collections Let's see, we don't have an actual page instance. Let me, let me look at the docs there for this add child because I can either instantiate a, a, a wagtail um, page instance, which is fine. Remember the, um, see I'm getting tired. Let's just go ahead and keep these in a comment. We'll need to get the title property of the I could call this row basically, but sorry. Yeah, let's just do that. Article row title 
So we'll create a magazine article instance. We will get the related issue and add it as a child of that issue. And we're going to do that for just three articles now. Organize this commented out code a minute. authors later. see if we need to save. I don't know if we actually need to call the save method on this. I'll try it once without and once with if needed. Ready? Here we go. Okay, magazine article is not subscriptable. So... So close, so close. Oh no. This just needs to be row. There we go. Okay, hopefully this worked. So now I'm in the magazine issues. If I um, browse this way, for example, make sure the server is running. There it is, magazine. On art, has a sub item with three articles. Oh, really cool. Basically, what we're going to be doing is just importing the raw body text uh, here and displaying it raw and then eventually moving towards a rich text to editing experience uh, that follows Wagtail's kind of block model. So I'm going to call it good for today. I'll uh, run over this whole import process just once over to kind of get an idea of how long it takes. The following steps will be to iterate over the article authors and make a foreign key relationship uh, to um, essentially previously imported authors, um, which you can see a bunch of them here. And likewise, we'll need to associate it with one department and one or more tags. So kind of taking the lesson we learned today with the issue um, and maybe changing it up just slightly. I'm not sure exactly how it'll work. In any case, let's go ahead and delete all these articles.
and run the importer on the whole set. Oh, actually, you probably don't need to run it on the whole whole set to be honest, because with the issues, uh, article authors and uh, the other parts, I'm not going to want to. too much overhead again so eh, we'll just leave it be <laughs> pretty cool though all right so let's take a look at what's changed this I can just delete now and push the changes up if you're interested in uh, trying the code out at home it's hosted on github.com slash western friend it's an open source project uh, there's got quite a lot of features that are um, you know not just simple like a, you'd get from a blog tutorial it's a full-fledged website with a bookstore and on you know online orders and shipping and uh, flat rate shipping and uh, online payments uh, magazine issues with a subscription model that subscribers get access to the latest three issues and uh, the rest of the issues are um, open to the general public so yeah it's got quite a lot of patterns that might be useful in other projects that you're working on similarly if you're interested in getting involved in open source projects in general the codebuddies.org platform is undergoing a rewrite from the ground up the it'll be split into two projects the back end is currently being prototyped at least with Django uh, I don't know if it's a hundred percent certain that the next generation backend will be Django powered, but if the prototype turns out good, I think uh, it's likely to uh, replace the current generation. And the front end is being prototyped with React. I, React. I think both Django and React are the main uh, candidates for implementing the next codebase.org. If you want to get involved with that project, we've got tasks that are uh, suitable for beginners and uh, experienced developers alike. And as is uh, common with the CodeBuddies ethos, uh, everybody is uh, kind of co-learning. Uh, we all have something to learn from one another and uh, we can help each other along our learning journeys. So that's why I'm hosting these live stream uh, hangout sessions on Twitch so you can kind of see uh, the development process for open source stuff and we can have interesting uh, conversations in the chat. So do feel free to leave me a message, uh, open an issue on GitHub, I'll try to respond in a timely fashion. Thanks for hanging out and checking out this stream. Stay safe out there and have a great day.